when I was in high school, uh, in the English class, it was either my freshman or sophomore year, we were assigned a, a book by Charles Dickens. I believe it was entitled Tale of Two Cities. You open that, and it begins by saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And uh, I think we've experienced some of that. There's some of that that goes on in our lives on a daily basis. We see some of the best movement of God amidst some of the worst situations and circumstances of our lives. And as I think about that line, I can't help but think about the passage that we're going to read this morning in the life of Abraham as he dealt with two sons. One of the sons was the son of promise. The other of the sons was the son of his flesh, a reminder of his sin. And God does that in our lives from time to time. He puts those reminders there in order to teach us. And I believe Abraham was certainly part of that teaching experience. But we here, thousands of years later, can have the opportunity of learning as we read this text this morning. And so today we are looking at the two sons of Abraham, the son of faith, and the son of flesh. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 21, and I invite you to stand this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word as we look at these two sons. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time at which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight years old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have... Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make uh, make a nation of your son, of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, but the distance, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a, gener- uh, make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we see in this story two young boys. Father, they each represent something very different. Father, I pray today that you would bring clarity to our hearts and minds as we look at both Isaac and Ishmael, that we might be sons and daughters who walk in the promise of God, that we might be the sons and daughters who walk in the freedom of God. Father, we may avoid and walk not in the things of Ishmael, a child of the flesh, a child of the natural, a child that's a slave to sin. Father, may you give us freedom this morning. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable unto you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
This text is set up in this way to remind us of a couple of things. First, if you've been following along with us in the book of Genesis as we've been studying this over the last few months, you'll remember back to earlier in the book where Abraham was promised that he would be the father of a great nation, that God would give him a son, and through that son, all the promises of God would be fulfilled, that he would have a land and that he would have a people. And so Abraham leaves Ur of the Chaldeans and goes to where God tells him to go. And when he gets there, some time passes and he has no son. So he starts to look around and wonder what's God going to do? How's God going to give me a land and a people if I don't have any sons? And he's now getting old in age and his wife is now old in age. And, and so Sarah, his wife, comes to him and says, you know, maybe God was mistaken Maybe I'm not the mother that's going to give you this son. Therefore, you should take my slave, Hagar, and have a relationship with her, and she can bear you a son. And maybe that's how God wants to give us his blessing and fulfill his promise through this. And so Abraham, being the foolish person that he was, not listening to the Lord, and went off and said, that sounds like a great idea. And he has Hagar as his uh, uh, woman for the night, and she has a baby named Ishmael, a son. And it becomes real, uh, real apparent real fast that this was not what God intended. And so Hagar and Ishmael are on their way back to Egypt when God stops them and says, whoa, you go back. You're not the son of the, of the promise, but I will take care of you, and I will care for you, and I will bless you. I hear you, Hagar. He, we, there we learn that God is the God who hears as Hagar cries out in the desert. So many years then have passed and the angels are, uh, and the Lord show up at the tent of Abraham. We saw this about three weeks ago and reminds them again that Sarah is the one who's going to bear the child, the child that's going to give them the heirs, the, 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 the land and the people. And they, Sarah finds that humorous and and laughs, but God says, I will come back, and when I come back, you will bear a son. And so here we go. The time has now arisen, and Sarah is uh, not only pregnant, she is giving birth to Isaac. And now we have Isaac here, and now we have Ishmael that's still hanging around. We've got them in the family. So I don't know if you've ever been to an awkward family reunion, but I imagine this is an awkward family reunion. Right? You've, you've got mom and dad, but then you've got this newborn baby, but then you kind of got this side deal with, uh, with Hagar and Ishmael, and there's kind of some laughter, and there's some pointing, and there's some, um, some mocking going on, and it's just a real awkward party that's being thrown. And that's where we kind of pick up the fact that there's really two distinctions here. We're going to finish by kind of separating out what's the difference between the two boys. What's the difference between being a child of the promise or a child of faith and being a child of the flesh. So the first thing I want us to see as we jump into this text this morning is that walking by faith means trusting in God's timing. It means trusting in God's timing. There is nothing about the life of Abraham and Sarah, especially as they become older in age, that would say, now is your prime childbearing years. In fact, Sarah, it says, was too old to bear children. And yet, God says, in my timing. I don't know about you, but in my life, I like to have things timed out my way. I don't know if you've ever been in an airport waiting on an airplane when they get a notification that's been canceled. And you're thinking, that's not the right timing. Like, I have to get home. I have to get to this meeting. I have to... We don't control those things, do we? There are a lot of things that are out of our control. There's a lot of times that God shows up in our life, and it's either not the time that we were expecting, or perhaps it's not even the time we were wanting. Or perhaps we're asking God to do something and we feel like it needs to happen now and God says, no, it doesn't. I'll do that when it's time to do that. I'll work on that when it's time to work on that. I'll fix that when it's time to fix it. Or I might not fix it at all the way you think I ought to fix it. I might do something completely different. Or I might do nothing at all because nothing at all is better than what you're asking for. 
See, walking by faith means we're trusting that God has a plan, that he truly is working out all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes, as the Apostle Paul says. And that's what he's doing here. Look at verse 1 with me. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. My friends, what a powerful verse. We can read that real quick and just think it's the setup to the story. But it's not the setup to the story. It's one of the hinge points of the story. Sarah received from God what he said he was going to do, and he did it the way he said he was going to do it. You see, when God says it, you can take it to the bank. When God says it, he will do it. He didn't do it when Sarah wanted him to do it necessarily. He didn't do it when, he thought, when Sarah thought he should do it. Because in her mind, right, instead of uh, giving Hagar to Abraham, that would have been a better time in her mind. Like, I can bear, to, uh, I'm younger. It would be a better time. Now is the time. But God said, no, it's not the right time. You wait. Second verse says, And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. There's a right time for God to move. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore him, Isaac. There's an emphasis that Moses, as he writes these words, places on that. He wants us to be reminded that this is not a son from somebody else. This is the son, the miraculous son that God has given to Abraham through his wife, Sarah. Verse 4, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that doesn't fall into fatherly duties anymore. But even this line is to remind us that, God, that Abraham is being faithful to what God had told him to do. Remember back earlier in the book of Genesis, when God made his covenant with Abraham, he said to Abraham, look. You are to circumcise every male in your home as a sign of the covenant that you belong to me, that Yahweh is your God, and you are his people. And so Abraham, being obedient to God, circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. Verse 5, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now, I don't know about you. I'm about to be 48. I have a, a 12th grader all the way down to a 4th grader. Let's just say that it was a whole lot easier to get in, up and down off the floor when my 12th grader was in the 4th grade than it is now that my 4th grader is in the 4th grade. I cannot get up and move and do all of the things as quickly as I used to be able to do them. Now, thankfully, God has blessed me with pretty good health, and so I'm still pretty active, but I'm, you can't, I just can't do it as fast, and especially when I get out of the bed in the morning, right? When my feet hit the ground, it just takes a few moments to get everything loosened up. If you're not there yet, you'll get there, and some of you are ahead of me and can say, preach it, brother. Just the way life is, it's a whole lot harder. I have one of my sons who sleeps on the ground. Now, we have a bed for him, not <laughs> Calvin yelling out, not me, it's not him, all right? But I have one of my kids that loves to sleep on the floor. Now, he has a bed, but he chooses to sleep on the floor. And I'm not even talking about carpeted floor. He'll sleep on hardwood floor. If I slept on a hardwood floor all night, you just get to call the ER because I'm not getting up. <laughs> just get the ambulance there, man. My body doesn't do that anymore. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Verse 6, and Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his, own, his, in his old age. God has done a work, a miraculous work. And while the world around might think, how in the world is this possible? God has done it. So we read here about the birth of Isaac. Now, I was reading, I found this fascinating. This is not a complete rabbit's, uh, rabbit trail, but 
man, it was so good, I just wanted to share it. I was reading about this in uh, Arthur Pink's book, Gleanings from Genesis, and he says that he's found seven ways that the birth of Isaac compares to the birth of Jesus. And I just wanted to share these with you because I think this is clearly something that we ought to take note of. Because remember, Isaac is going to symbolize, and we're going to show you in a minute, that Isaac is going to symbolize the people of God, the people of faith. So here's the first reason he gives. Isaac was the promised seed and the promised son. Jesus was the promised seed and the promised son. Second, he says a lengthy interval occurred between the promise and its realization. Remember, God promised Abraham decades before Isaac was born. God promised Jesus centuries before Jesus was born. Third, he says, at the announcement of the birth, both Sarah and Mary both proclaimed there is nothing impossible with God. Sarah in Genesis 18, 13, Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Fourth reason, both the name Isaac and the name Jesus were given to their parents prior to their birth. Isaac, meaning son of laughter. Jesus, meaning the one who saves, or the Savior, or God saves. Fifth, both Isaac and Je Jesus were appointed exactly at the right time under the sovereign plan of God. We just talked about uh, Isaac's birth, but in uh, Galatians chapter 4 it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent them when he was ready to send them. He gave the sons when he was ready to give the sons in his timing. Sixth, both the birth of Isaac and the birth of Jesus required a miracle. Sarah and Abraham were physically too old to have children. Mary, because she had not been with a man, was physically unable to give birth to a child. God intervened. The Holy Spirit came upon her. Both were miraculous in nature. Seven, both Isaac and Jesus were the delight of their fathers. We're going to read in just a minute that as Isaac is weaned, Abraham throws a party. And the picture of, of, of the laughter that happens there is a picture of joy, that Isaac was the delight of his dad. My friends, Jesus was the delight of his father. In fact, in Jesus' birth, the angels proclaimed glory to God in the highest. When Jesus began his public ministry and walked down into the Jordan River, the skies opened and the voice of God shouted down, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. See, I think there's a picture here that as we look at the life of Isaac, the birth of Isaac, it's a, it's a promise, it's God, it's a movement, it's His Spirit. And as we're going to see in just a minute, the birth of Isaac is about the flesh. It's about the law. It's about taking things into your own hands instead of trusting God. It's about being born in the flesh and not of the Spirit. Which really leads us to our second point. Walking by sight means trusting in the flesh. Ishmael represents the natural. It's what happens when Abraham and Sarah do it their way. Like the old Frank Sinatra song, I'll do it my way. That's kind of how this mentality has been. Ishmael, it comes when Abraham and, I, Abraham and Sarah don't do it the way God's wanting them to do it. When they're not walking by uh, uh, faith, they're walking by sight. Look at verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. You see, there's always double play here on these words. Right? Laughter can be both joy and laughter can be a way of mocking. See, the very same situation that Abraham and Sarah are laughing with joy because God has met their uh, need. He's provided. He's, he's shown himself strong. You have Hagar and Ishmael over on the other side mocking and laughing. And, Ab and Sarah saw this and as would be natural for any mom, became very defensive of her son, saying, no, it's not that child who will be the child of the promise. It's my child. And Abraham, being the father of both, feels a, a tear, right? Because there's obviously a love and affection for both of his sons. But we do notice that their party was not thrown for Ishmael. The party was thrown 
for Isaac. See, there's great delight there. So, Abraham, so she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And this thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, I love that phrase. I love the fact that here Abraham is wrestling in this moment. I don't know about you other husbands in the room, but there's probably been some moments at which your wife's not been happy about something, right? And you're not sure exactly what to do about it. Like, I, I can't fix it. I don't even know if I should say anything or what should I say. Or if I say this, it'll probably be the wrong thing. And you got, man, Abraham is walking with God because God goes, here, let me tell you what you're supposed to do. I need some of that, God. Would you just help me? God just speaks to him. God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Reminding Isaac of the promise. I mean, reminding Abraham of the promise. It is not through Ishmael that I'm going to do what I'm going to do. It is through Isaac. Ishmael was your fleshly decision. Isaac was my spiritual decision. He says, I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. And then as we read these next many verses, we see that God still blesses Ishmael. He provides for him. Sarah, uh, Hagar takes him out on their way to Egypt. He meets them in the desert once again. Just as he met Hagar and, and Ishmael in the desert before, he meets them again. He is gracious and merciful, but it is a clear and contrasting picture between the two. Now, you might be saying, well, I don't see all of the clear and contrasting picture between the two, and that's all right, because I'm going to give it to you more clearly. See, in the book of Galatians, Paul uses this exact chapter to unpack a powerful spiritual truth that I want to help us unpack this morning, which leads us to our third point. Walking by faith brings freedom, while walking in the flesh brings slavery. Walking by faith brings freedom, while walking in the flesh brings slavery. See, Ishmael is a represent representation of our first birth, our natural birth, our fleshly birth. Every one of us in here, because the fact that we're in here means we have been born of the flesh. We have flesh, we're alive, we're in this room. Ishmael is representative of that first birth. But my friends, not every one of us in this room has been born of the Spirit. Because there's a big difference between being born of the flesh and being born of the Spirit. This is what uh, Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must be born again. Every one of you has been born in the flesh, but not every one of you has been born in the Spirit. See, to be born in the Spirit means that you no longer belong to the things of this world, but now you belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Isaac represents the second birth. Ishmael was born first. Isaac was born second. We're all born in the flesh. The question is this morning is, will you be born in the Spirit? Let's look at Galatians chapter 4. Here's what Paul writes. Well, before I read this, I'm going to give you a little background. Paul is writing to the church at Galatia because there's a group of believers there who keep wanting to go back and earn God's approval through their works, specifically through circumcision. What did we just read? Abraham circumcised Isaac as the Lord had told him. Because in the, in the Old Testament, circumcision was an outward mark that you belong to Yahweh, that you are one of Yahweh's people. So then you get to the New Testament, and Jesus comes and lives his ministry, dies on the cross, is buried in the grave, and on the third day he's raised from the dead, demonstrating his power over sin and death, and initiating through that event a new covenant that he says is in my blood. It is no longer of the law. It's no longer outward sign. It's now an inward transformation that happens. That the, our lives are hidden with Christ. Our hearts, have been our hearts of stone have been removed, as Jeremiah says, and they've been replaced with hearts of flesh. We're now sensitive to the working of God because of what the Holy Spirit has done. 
And so Paul is writing because there's a group in the church that says, before you can come to the Jesus, first you have to become a Jew. Before you can come to faith in Christ, you first have to do all the outward things to to prove that you want to belong to God. So you need to be circumcised outwardly, just like the Jews of the Old Testament, before you can come to Christ. And Paul says, no, that's not the new covenant. The new covenant in the blood of Christ is not a covenant of law, it's a covenant of faith. You now come to God, not through the law, but through his son Jesus, through faith in his son Jesus. And so he's writing these words to the church there to remind them of that. And he says, for it is written, verse 22, that Abraham had two sons. Now let's pause right there. Because there are people out there, you may sometimes hear them on TV or read articles about them saying, you know what, for the New Testament, because the Old Testament writes about law, it, it's not really that important for Christians today to read the Old Testament. And I would say, that's foolishness. While we are not under the Old Covenant, we cannot fully understand and appreciate the New Covenant if we don't spend time at least reflecting on the fact that God gave the Old Covenant. And so what happens here, uh, Paul writes that, for it is written. What is it written? Exactly what we just read in Genesis chapter 21. If Paul found it appropriate and necessary to draw our attention back to the work of God in Genesis chapter 21, then it's just as important for us today to draw our hearts and minds back to the work of God in decades and centuries and millennia past. So he says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, and one by a free woman. Now, you might be thinking, who is that? He's going to explain, but I'll give you the the Cliff Notes version. The slave woman was Hagar. The free woman was Sarah. He says in verse 23, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. We just talked about that, right? That Sarah and uh, or that Abraham and Hagar went on their own and did things not according to what God said, but according to what they thought was best, what their flesh thought was best, and not what God thought was best. And so Ishmael represents all the times that we work out of the natural, out of the flesh. All right? So it says, but the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. God's promise to Abraham and Sarah that he would give them a son. Verse 24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. Now I want to pause right there and say the best time to interpret Scripture allegorically is when God tells you to interpret it allegorically. For the most part, that's not a great way to interpret Scripture. All right? I've read... Uh, a lot of texts where it's like, well, this means this, and this means this, and this means this, and you just have to be super careful because most of the times that's not what's being said there. But in this case, Paul tells us this is what's being said here. So we can do this allegorically because Paul has told us that this is how we interpret this text. The New Testament always gives us a better interpretation of the Old Testament. It helps us understand what was going on when maybe we didn't see it at first. Because I can tell you, if you just read Genesis chapter 21 and weren't familiar at all with the New Testament, you would have a hard time understanding what Paul is saying here. So he says this, we'll interpret it allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is the old covenant under law. One is the new covenant of faith and grace. One is of Mount Sinai, which is where the law was giving, bearing children for slavery because why? We're slaves of the law. If we're not in Christ, we're slaves under the law. We cannot live the way God has called us to live. He's told us how to do it. We can't do it. We continually fail. Therefore, we're lost in our sin. Or the new covenant, we come to faith in Christ. We trust in him. Jesus did what we could not do, which is live a perfect life, obeying every law. And therefore, we are given his righteousness, not because we've earned it, but because he's earned it for us. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to present Jerusalem. He's saying, hey, you know, they're in Galatia there, not too far from Jerusalem. He's saying, that's what's still going on over there in Israel. 
Those who are apart from the work of Christ, who have not placed their faith and trust in Christ, they're still up there sacrificing animals. They're still up there uh, circumcising uh, children. They're still trying to earn God's approval through their outward deeds, through their actions. And he's saying, that's not what I'm telling you we're supposed to be doing. We're going to earn God's approval because of what Christ has done. Christ has earned God's approval for us. You'll never earn it in your flesh. So that's the sons of slavery, and you are the sons of freedom. Because he says in verse 26, but the Jerusalem above, right, the, the heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God that is now here, is not of Jerusalem, it is of Christ. Verse 27, for it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of, those, of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Oh, that's good news for us. That's good news for us, because just like the church at Galatia, if we place our faith and trust in Jesus, we don't have to live by the law, a law that could never save us. Now, that doesn't mean that our actions don't matter. That doesn't mean that he has not purposed us for love and good works, because he has. But that's not what saves us. says, verse 29, of oh, verse 28, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise, but just as that time, as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. We saw that, right? Isaac is being weaned, and what happens? Ishmael and Hagar begin to mock Sarah, Abraham, and Isaac with their laughter. They, I imagine they begin to taunt them. They begin to uh, make faces at them, laugh at them, thinking he's not even the firstborn. I, I can just imagine the hateful things that Hagar was thinking and saying. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Here's the key word. Also as it is now. Have you ever been persecuted for being a person of faith? There's people out there all the time, right? I, I sat on an airplane not super long ago with somebody who, when I found out, when we were making small talk, he found out I was a pastor, I, mean, I could see in his eyes, like, why are you wasting your life like that? Why wouldn't you go getting into business? You seem like a sharp person. You could be making all kinds of money. You could be doing all kinds of things. Why would you waste your life doing it? He couldn't fathom or understand why somebody would want to do what I do. Maybe you've been out there, and you, you were talking to someone, and they said, hey, let's go so-and-so for the weekend. And you said, hey, I got, I'm going to be in church on Sunday. And they're like, why are you wasting your time with that? You believe all those fairy tales? You believe all that stuff? They just mock you, make fun of you. And then we're not going to try and pretend like our persecution here is the same as the persecution that happens in China or Iran or wherever, but we're all experienced it from time to time, a mocking or a, a laughter that happens. And he says, so also it is now. See, people who are born of the flesh will not understand the life of somebody born in the Spirit. It makes no sense to them. They mean, what do you mean you can live before God and, and you don't have to worry about what you do? You don't have to worry about whether or not God's happy or sad with you, whether or not your actions make him, make him happy today or not. Like, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean you've been saved by faith? What do you mean you didn't do anything? Does it make sense to a world that's all about, I've got to earn things, I've got to I've got to seek God through my actions all the time. And if I don't do well, he's mad at me and he hates me. And I might not make it to heaven. But if I do good, then maybe he loves me and he'll take me and I'll be in heaven. This doesn't make sense to people who are born of the flesh. But verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Oh, what a great verse. Because I'm here to tell you this morning, that's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks. 
It doesn't matter what your family member thinks. It doesn't matter what your boss thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You know what the only thing that matters in life is? What God thinks. And I love that Paul says, but what does God say? Oh, that that would be our response anytime we're at a crossroads in life. Anytime we face a challenge in life. Anytime we face a decision in life. It wouldn't be, what do I want to do? That's a decision of the flesh. It wouldn't be, what, what is everybody else expecting me to do? That's a decision of the flesh. What a decision of the Spirit looks like is when we ask the question, but what does God say I should do? Because if God says I should do it, then I should do it. And it doesn't matter what everybody else says. So he says, but what does God say? Or what does Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Verse 31, so brothers, we are not children of the slave, but children of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He's saying, do not go back to circumcision. Do not go back to the outward things of the flesh, thinking that God's going to find give you approval because of it. Focus on the Spirit. Be born again. Walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So as we close this morning, I want to pose two questions to you. First, have you experienced the second birth? Have you been born again into the Spirit of God? Because all of us have been born in the flesh, but my friends, in a room this big, with this many people, there's a high probability that not all of us have been born again in the Spirit. You go, how do I know the difference? I know we've been born in the flesh. That's obvious. We're here. But how do I know if I've been born in the Spirit? And I'll give you this. Have you recognized, trusted, and accepted Jesus Christ as your righteousness, as your only hope, as your Savior, as the only one that can bring you to heaven? Have you trusted in His death, burial, and resurrection, knowing that what He has done for you, you could not do for yourself? Have you put away the things of the flesh, trying to earn God's approval, and now are trying to walk in the Spirit towards the things of God? That is what it means to be born again. Trusting what Christ has done for you. Not of your flesh, as Paul says in Ephesians, lest any of us should boast, but walking in the faith that is Christ. It's not some card you sign. It's not that you got baptized. Right? Those are outward signs like circumcision. That's something you did. You signed a card. You got in a baptistry. You got dunked under water. Those are fine things. Those are great things, but they don't save any of us. Second birth or second life, new life, comes only when the Spirit of the living God comes upon you as you express faith in Christ. Not of your works. So I ask you this morning, have you given your life to Christ through faith and experienced His grace in your life? If not, I invite you to do that this morning. Second question I would ask, if you have done that, if you have trusted in Christ, if Christ is now the Savior and Lord of your life, are you still going back and trying to live in the flesh? Or are you still thinking, well, if I don't do that, God's displeased with me. Or maybe I can lose my salvation. Or maybe God, God is going to be so angry with me that... Put that aside. You walk in the freedom that comes from Christ. You walk in the freedom that you are no longer under the law, but you are under the freedom and grace of Christ. Now, that freedom, as Paul says elsewhere in Romans, is not a license to do whatever you want, but it's not ever what saves you. Maybe this morning you need to be answering the first question and inviting Christ to come into your life and save you from your sins. But maybe you're already a believer this morning and you need to repent of trying to walk this thing out in your flesh. 
because you can't do it. Sin reminds me of that game at Chunky Cheese, Whack-A-Mole, right? Of every time I get one of those little moles beat down, one of them pops back up somewhere else. And if that's your life, you're going to live frustrated because you're going to think, I'm never getting anywhere. I'm never going to win this game. And you're right. You will never get all the moles beat down. You'll never get all the sin beat out of your life. But here's the good news. Jesus has beat every sin. He's conquered every temptation. And He did it for you. And the Scripture says that what He did right, and you and I couldn't, now belongs to you. His righteousness is your righteousness, and our sin went upon Him. So I ask you, do you know Him this morning? And are you walking by grace instead of law? 